we go. We're going to the book of Colossians. Last week we started. We're just going to run through the book of Colossians, teach it line upon line, and uh, find out what we can see from the Holy Spirit. Amen? You know, the Bible's so full of things. You know, a lot of times we do topical studies. That's one way to study the Bible. Another way to study the Bible is, uh, is to just read it. And so that's kind of what we're doing with this is we're just going to take a book, and we've done this several times on different books of the Bible, and just go through them line upon line, precept upon precept, and, uh, and see all the little hidden mysteries in there. You know, that's how the Bible's written. And so it's written kind of in a mystery, and, and as we get, when we get filled with the Spirit, we can understand things real, uh, rightly and real. And so we go through it with the Holy Spirit, we can, we can glean all sorts of things in every passage. Amen? Amen. So, whatever you have need of tonight, you can find the answer in the Scripture. Amen. Whatever you have need of in life tonight, you can find your answer in the Scripture. Yeah. So, hear the Word of God, receive it into your life, apply it into your uh, into your consciousness and let this take root in you. Let the Word of God take root in you. That's the only thing that can make you happy in life. Hallelujah. Did you know the Word of God is the only thing that can make you happy? Yeah. Did you know that? I mean, it's the Lord, but the Lord is the Word. Jesus is the Word. It's the only thing that can sustain you and keep you satisfied in life. Yeah. Money won't do it. Some of you uh, actually have money and you know that it doesn't do it. Those that don't have money think that money will do it, but it never does. Never satisfies the soul. Sure. And that's why no matter how rich you get, you're still never satisfied. And, and some of you have had some fun in life. Anybody ever had any fun in life? Lord, help them have fun. We want them to have fun. God likes us to have fun. But you know, if you've ever had any fun, you know it doesn't satisfy you. Because it ends and then you're desperate for more. But the Word of God endures forever. Yeah. And so if you'll learn to get satisfied on the Word of God, it'll sustain you forever, daily. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. All right. Well, here we are. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 is where we'll begin. Um, Colossians 1, 24. Paul says this by the Spirit. Now, remember, Paul wrote these to the church at Colossae. He wrote these letters to churches, but he, he was inspired by the Spirit to do it. Now, let me say a word about that, that when we say the Bible is inspired by God, it doesn't mean that God kind of gave you good feel. He didn't give Paul good feelings. Here's some good feelings and some inspiration. Now, go write what you want. That's not what it means. The word inspire means to breathe into. So the words in Scripture are breathed into people for them to pen just like a, a CEO would dictate to a secretary, hey, type this out. Dictate exactly what you want. That's what God did to man. And that's how the Bibles were. Sure, it was penned by man, but it was inspired, breathed into by God. Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. <clears throat> I know we wish we could erase that part. But he suffered for us. Now, when I, when I read this, I put myself in the you part. You know, Paul suffered so that I could have this Bible. Do you know that? Paul suffered so that I could understand these things about God. And suffering doesn't mean he had cancer or some weird disease or was all afflicted and tormented daily by demons and stuff. That, that's, that's wrong. By covenant, we're safe from the devil. Except through other people in the form of persecution. So when the New Testament writers talked about sufferings, they're not talking about, you know, common everyday struggles, cares of life. They're talking about persecution for righteousness sake. They're not talking about sickness, disease, and tragedy. They're talking about persecution for the gospel's sake. Okay, so you got to understand that because it's talked about affliction and suffering. It was because they were everywhere they went, they were getting stoned and beaten and chased and you know, uh, attacked by the religious folks. We don't have that today. So we don't even almost, almost we don't relate to that. You know, especially Americans, we almost don't even relate to the sufferings and afflictions that are mentioned by the apostles. Well, when we see those words, we think, oh yes, you know, my boss, he's so tough. We, we, we come to some natural thing that we're, we're dealing with, but, but really we're supposed to rise way above those things. The cares of life aren't supposed to burden us down and kill us. But really for Americans, it's the cares of life that are robbing us, right? 
It's certainly not persecution for righteousness sake. <clears throat> so he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. For the sake of his body, which is the church. Notice the intent and the purpose for what Paul suffered. It was for the church. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fill the word, to fulfill the word of God. Verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his saints. Now notice this word mystery, okay? Now we've taught extensively on this in the past but note that this gospel was a mystery. Okay? Have you ever heard anybody say that God works in mysterious ways? The Bible never says God works in mysterious ways. That's not a scripture, but it's quoted uh, so much that it seems like it must be a scripture. You know, he works in mysterious ways. Usually it's people that have no clue what the Bible says that say that. Now, right? Sinners will say it. Atheists will say it. Oh, no, atheists don't, don't believe in God. Sinners will say it. Nominal Christians, baby Christians, they'll say it because they've heard it said before. And when something that we don't quite understand happens, well, God must have done it. It's kind of mysterious. Um, and certainly there's things we don't understand, sure. And certainly there's behind the, scene th behind the scene things that God's doing, and we don't know of them. But he used to be mysterious, things before the cross were all dark and mysterious. The Jews lived under a mystery. They didn't understand. Isn't that right? It was so mysterious they missed the Christ. The Jews didn't know they were living in darkness. That's part of the mystery. People in darkness don't realize they're in darkness. Till the light shines you're supposed to come out of the darkness. So before the cross, everything was a mystery. God was hard to understand. He was, all, he was spoken of in dark sayings. The prophecies were very hard to understand. But after the cross of Christ, Jesus Christ, the light of the world came. Jesus shines the light so we can all see where we're headed. He shines the light on the mystery. He, he sticks the flashlight on the, the road map. He shows us exactly the plan of God that was hidden. Does that make sense? So because Jesus is alive, we have light. And God doesn't have to remain dark and mysterious. Now, if you're not saved, Jesus hasn't shined the light in your soul. The unsaved person doesn't have light. Only saved people have light. That's why an unsaved person takes a look at this Bible and they just... Because the Bible is written in a mystery. The Bible is not written in outline school book form starting with point one and ending with point Z. Wait, that would be point A. <laughs> the Bible's not written just for any old Joe to open it up and understand the things of God. God requires, number one, that you want to understand. He requires, number two, that you believe starting on square one in order to get to Z. No, A, square A to get to Z. Does that make sense? So it requires the Holy Spirit. To unveil this requires the Holy Spirit. Amen. So only saved people get to understand. Only saved people get to see. Only those that desire to know can know. You have to be hungry before you're filled. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they'll be filled. If you're not hungry, you don't eat. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the world. No, it doesn't say that. But now has been revealed to the Jews. No, it doesn't say that. But now has been revealed to all religious people everywhere. But now has been revealed to his saints. Now, we already established that either you're a sinner or a saint. Saint is not some tag you get if you've lived a good life. Saint is what you are when you receive Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. You enter into a relationship where God, in God's class, where everyone is a saint. Hallelujah. 
Even if you don't act like it, you're called a saint. You might be a dodo saint, but you're a saint. <clears throat> Flip over to here verse, uh, in Ephesians. We'll come back to Colossians, but about, ten page, about five pages to the left is Ephesians chapter 1. I want to say some more things about the mystery. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Uh, as Christians, as, as saints and believers, we don't have to go through life wondering what God's will is. For our own personal life, for the grand scheme of things, we don't have to be wondering what God's will is. I know a lot of Christians that beat themselves up for years trying to find God's will. The truth is if you'll just relax a little bit and open up your soul and admit some things and start with Scripture, you'll find out God's will. Amen. Usually people that can't find God's will, they have some grandiose idea in their mind of some grand thing they're supposed to do or wonder what they must be called to do. And it all, it all kind of points to a selfish nature. What has God called me to do? Don't do that. Don't go there, okay? There's too much me. The emphasis was on the wrong word, okay? If you'll just start doing scripture right now in your daily life, you'll, you'll bump into the will of God. If you'll apply scripture line upon line into your life, you will be in the will of God and you won't miss it. Some people are so scared about missing it. Some people are so scared about being used by God. Heard this so many times. I just want to be used by God. I just want to be used by God. And they go years and years and years actually being useless to God. Sure, we all want to be used by God, but if that's your testimony, then you've missed something. You've got self in front. Self can't be in front of your life. You, you can't put self out there in the, in, in the forefront you're going to have to do scripture, you'll bump in the will of God. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Turn with me to chapter 3, verse 1, Ephesians 3, 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. Hallelujah. By which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. By, uh, excuse me, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. So Abraham didn't understand. Isaiah didn't understand. Isn't that right? Now, they saw glimpses. Those were two that were listed as those who did see some things. It was still uncertain. Abraham did believe and understood there would be a Savior. Isaiah did see Jesus on the cross. So they did catch glimpses, but they lived without the new birth. They lived without the Holy Spirit. So the things they saw were cloudy. Just barely a frame. They just get to see one picture, one frame of the prophecy of God or the prediction that was to come or the Messiah himself. They'd get one frame and they would tell what they saw. Even John, I mean, not, not John, uh, even Ezekiel, you know, they, he saw the end time, but just a frame or two. Some of them got more than one frame, but they didn't see clearly because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. All right, go back to Colossians with me. I just want you to see that now we know the mystery, okay? And so every hungry, every Christian at some point ought to decide, you know what, I want to know things. I want to know things. Amen. I've noticed how, um, you know, humans, or we could say even Christians, uh, from unsaved to saved, just people in general, it seems, are very motivated by inspiration, we want to be inspired. We, we love it when we just see an, uh, a story of, that inspires me. We read a book because it's inspiring. We, we like to hear preaching that's inspiring. Isn't that right? But sometimes we get addicted to the inspiration and we miss something else. You know, you can sit there, people sit there and click YouTube videos, just watching for something to make them laugh, something to inspire them, something that was cute, something that was, 
You know, on Facebook, people are sending out little bleeps and little three sentences that inspire me. I mean, a little, little inspiration here, a little inspiration there. And, and, and we need inspiration. Don't get me wrong. You need some fuel sometimes. You need a spark sometimes. You need some encouragement. You need to be inspired. Part of, part of life is being inspired. But you can't live off inspiration. Can't live off inspiration. At some point, your inspiration is going to have to have a foundation, a root in which to spring from. Our inspiration, that's why preaching that's only inspiring must be combined with preaching that is revelatory. You need both in your life. And so we need revelation. Revelation is where true inspiration comes from. You need, to, at some point, you're going to have to quiet your soul down. You're going to have to calm your soul down enough to learn right things about God. We need revelation. You're going to have to focus your attention to learn. Without learning sincere truth, your inspiration is fleeting. Does that make sense? Verse 27, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, the non-Jews, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here he kind of boils the whole mystery down to Christ in you. Christ in you. Not Christ on the cross, not Christ in heaven, not Christ at the right hand of the Father, but Christ in you, in you, in you. When we quote, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen. When we quote that, it's supposed to bring me to a, a knowledge of he's in me. I can do it because he's in me. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. That empowers me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We just kind of walk around. Yeah, yeah, he's up there. I, can do, I think I can do it. I'm going to try to do it. No, no, he's in me and it's supposed to light my eyes on. It's supposed to charge me up somehow. Some, something's supposed to take place spiritually because he's in me. Now that's the mystery that he's in me. He's in me, I'm in him, we're together. All things are possible because he's in me. He's supposed to take me over. This sanctification is where Jesus, the person, actually takes me over. Where I live my life according to the person of Jesus. I'm submitted to the person of Christ in me. My life is not my own. I'm not just trying to pull down a couple blessings as I go through life. Oh, yeah, God, if you just bless me here and give me a whole bunch of blessings. No, no, life's different than that. The blessings are, are, are they'll come, but the reality, uh, uh, this whole thing is about Christ in me. That I live submitted. I live leaning on Christ. I live with the character of Christ. I don't act or talk without him. He's my Lord. He's in me. He's my Lord. That's the mystery. Rather than me have to have, you know, a rule book. This is not my rule book. This is what teaches me of the person in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about until Christ be formed in you. This word of God helps Christ get formed in me. Amen. Take shape in me. New Christians sense it. Mature Christians see it. New Christians detect salvation in them. New Christians realize things have happened. Mature Christians see it and experience it in the fullness of Christ until Christ be formed in us. The mystery of the Gentiles, the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. That's the expectation of God's presence. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice that part of the preaching is supposed to warn you, teach you, and then present you to God. Hallelujah. If you guys show up in heaven uh, real, uh, with, with, with a lot of glory on you, perfected, 
I'll get some treasure. Other preachers will get some treasure. Other believers who helped will get treasure. Maybe we'll get treasure anyway, even if you didn't do it. Because we tried. To this end, I also labor. No, Paul, Paul, Paul thought he was laboring for people. Striving. Now, nobody really likes that word, but if you'll take yourself out of it, notice what he says. To this end, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. This life with God is not to be strived for. It's not to be stressed after. So we're not talking about human strain and stress and burden that you place on yourself to accomplish goals, be a Christian, etc. He's talking about striving according to the working that works in him. According to his working that works in him. And that's where the greater is he that's, that's where you have to lean on the grace of that the grace of God. That's where the Holy Spirit becomes the worker. Or the one that takes the burden. How about that? Just take the burden. Wouldn't it be nice if God just took your burden? Well, Jesus said my burden's light, so, so we have to let him take our burden. So, so that we're not dragging through life all of our strange struggles and, and wishes. 1, chapter 2. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and as for many as have I not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged... Being knit together in love. Notice that's always a theme through the New Testament. Is knit together in love. And attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. To the knowledge of the mystery of God. Both of the Father and of Christ. There it is again. Attaining to all riches. Of the full assurance of understanding. Notice we're based on understanding. It's not enough to just be inspired. We have to get some understanding. You don't have to take notes in church, but you do have to get understanding in church. I don't like taking notes. I like to listen. I like to, I like to let it just suck on into the heart of my, to my heart. Does that make sense? But if you don't do that well, then you need to take notes. Or you need to get the CD and re-listen because we need understanding. Like, like we've said before, this whole thing is, is like, like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. You learn one thing on one week, one piece of the puzzle. Where does that fit in my understanding? As so I'm forming this knowledge of Christ in my own mind. Amen? You learn something about prosperity. You learn something about sanctification. You learn something about grace. And all of it starts to put a picture together that makes sense to you. So that you can have a foundation, so that, you can, so that you can live with God, so that he has a place to dwell in your soul. If you don't understand God, he can't live in there in full, fullness. Technically, he would be in you, but in fullness, you can't experience that because your soul is so tiny, you don't understand much. The more you see of God and understand of God, the more you experience of God. Yeah, faith comes by hearing. Your faith and your heart have to be enlarged in order to receive the capacity of God. Baby Christians can have fun with their little one piece they've learned. I love baby Christians. I'm not putting baby Christians down. If you're a baby Christian, praise God for you. We need you. Right? But after a while, baby Christians need a few more pieces. And we have to grow. The mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The hidden treasures of, doesn't say inspiration and encouragement. All the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I, I am absent in the flesh, let, let, uh, yet I'm with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Just note that one thing. He, he thought that somebody might deceive you with persuasive words. And that's why we, I, I feel an obligation to warn you about TV preachers. Okay? Some of them are great. Some of them aren't. Don't let anybody move you with persuasive words. Don't let anybody steal your money with persuasive words. Amen. That goes for salesmen as well. But don't let anybody, 
Don't let anybody move you from this, the gospel you've heard and known with persuasive words. They'll sound persuasive, and sometimes we sit there thinking, well, they're on TV. They must know what they're talking about. And they don't. Okay. See, that's going over real big. <laughs> I just stepped on your favorite preachers. <laughs> no, some of your favorite preachers are probably fine. Amen. Yeah, yeah. But don't let people move you if, unless it's scripture. Amen. <clears throat> you got to trust. Even as a new Christian, I knew this. Sitting there watching people on TV, I didn't know the whole Bible. I was sincerely hungry for God and I was studying and, and searching for God and seeking the Lord and seeking the kingdom. And then I'd hear some things and, and there was times I heard stuff and I thought, that doesn't really sound right. Huh, I'll put that on the shelf. Another one, I didn't, that doesn't really sound right. Put that on the shelf. Other things I have actually received. Personally, I'll just tell on myself, I actually received some things that weren't true. I heard some things and, and thought, well, yep, must be. That sounds good to me. And, and within about a year or two or three later, all of a sudden, I kind of drifted out of that thinking, that's wrong. That's wrong. So just because it's said over and over on TV doesn't mean it's right. Amen. It's the truth. Uh, as a pastor, I feel obligated to make sure that you hear all the right things all the time. I mean, it's like we're riding a horse, and you've got to keep that horse in the... You're going to yank it back and yank it back and yank it back and yank it back. and you, uh, Don't let him go into the tree. You ever done that before? You ever ridden a horse? Let him go... To, can't let him go into the tree. That'll knock you off. <laughs> I used to ride horses with my cousin, and I was just a kid, and, and one time the horse took off with me on it. And ran me straight under a tree, and I had to duck, you know. And, and finally, I stopped the horse. My cousin came running up, and she chewed me out. She said, don't you ever let that horse drag you under a tree. <laughs> Same thing. Don't let any false doctrine drag you under. Amen. Don't let anybody move you with persuasion. I mean, we're serious about getting right stuff taught in here. You're not going to be... You're not gonna be uh, uh, deceived here in, in Houston Faith Church. Amen. You just won't. Amen. You just won't. Let, let, let the, hear the truth uh, over and over again, and if you ever have any questions, you can always ask. We'll always help. We'll always clarify. We'll always get to the, get, get to the bottom of it. You have to know this. I am, I am dead set on it. Amen? Amen. Even good fun stuff that people are saying out there ain't right. Some of it ain't right. It's distracting. It's wrong. Only the word of God will last and make you happy. So then he says, I want to see your steadfast, the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Verse 6, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted, verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Who I love this passage. This script, I love this. Rooted, rooted, rooted and grounded. Rooted and built up. Established. That's a firm person who doesn't fall away. Remember the parable of the sower? Some of the seed sown is on shallow ground that doesn't have any depth of earth, so it, it dries up, has no root, withers away. We see that all the time with Christians who hear some truth and they have no root, don't spend any time trying to root themselves. So they dry up, wither away. Before you know it, they're still in the world. But we're supposed to get rooted and built up. Proverbs 12, 3 says that a man is not established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous cannot be moved. Amen. Proverbs 10, 25 says, when the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. Remember the, the uh, wise and foolish man in Matthew 7? The wise man built his house on a rock. The foolish man built his house on sand. Storm comes, comes to everybody. If you're not rooted, you'll get washed off. Amen. Proverbs 2 says, For the upright will dwell in the land, the blameless will, will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the earth, and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. So at some point, quickly, 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 you're going to have to get faithfulness as part of your life. 
faithfulness? Can people count on you? Can you count on yourself? Are you faithful to your word? Are you, are you in always? Are you committed to anything? Sometimes people are, the only thing they're committed to is the job that pays them money. The only thing some people are committed to is their job. Oh yeah, and their mother and their child, and that's it. That's dangerous life to live. Amen. Hallelujah. I know we're getting all serious tonight, I understand, but we need it. Let's read it again. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. Yes, right. Come on, it's time, it's time not to be distracted uh, into babyhood. Sometimes people get so distracted by life that they just remain baby Christians the rest of their life. It's no way, no. <laughs> As you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. We did a message this year called Thanksgiving is our faith style. Faith, Thanksgiving is how we faith people look and sound. We're giving thanks always. The Bible says in the last days perilous times will come and it gives a list of things that will happen. Uh, men will be unthankful. That's one of them. Unthankful. Not grateful for anything. Having a hard time thanking God for anything. Certainly can't thank him for what's to come. You know, all prayer is supposed to be given with thanksgiving in there. Get your prayer answered, you're going to have to learn how to thank him ahead of time. <clears throat> Verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Philosophy is always trouble in an intellectual society. Anybody ever take, go to college and take social, not social, what's it called? Sociology. I tried to forget that as soon as I learned it. I knew, I, even back then in college, I knew that that was stu stupid. Sigmund Freud and the id and the inner whatever, please. Philosophy will ruin you. And empty deceit according to, to the tradition of men. When the whole world's saying it, it's probably wrong. When all the news is saying it, it's probably wrong. When the world and the devil are championing it, it's wrong. When unsaved people tout it as their, their big thing, it's probably wrong. Oh, it's going over big tonight. I see it. I see it in your eyeballs. Accor and, and according to the basic principles of the world... To be worldly, to esteem the world so highly, not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. <clears throat> in him dwells, boy, we could just stay there all day, but we need to move on. Verse 10, and you are complete in him. Doesn't say you will be complete in him, but in Christ you're complete. Everybody, let's, let's practice that. Say, I'm complete. I'm complete, I'm complete in him. You single folks, say it out loud. I'm complete in him. Complete. Don't need anybody. I can have someone. Don't need anyone. I'm not needy. I'm complete. You're complete in him. You're made whole in him. No matter what you feel inside, the truth is more powerful than that. You're complete in Christ. You Christians that have been around a long time, you're complete in him. Well, go ahead and say, you, you older Christians, say, I'm complete in him. You're complete. We live our life. I'm telling you, humans live their life thinking that they're missing something. Always picturing themselves not quite there yet. Don't do that. Keep, keep, going, at, keep going after God. Keep, keep gaining. But don't live your life thinking that you've, you know, you're never there. I want you to know you're there. You're complete in Christ. Hallelujah. He thinks you're complete in him. Sure, he knows there's some things that he, things are going to change in the future and things you're attaining for, I mean attaining and striving for. 
but the whole process, he's thinking you're complete. You know, it's just like a kid growing up, you know, the child, sure, you know that uh, the, the 10-year-old child has a ways to go, but you don't look at that 10-year-old child thinking, you old thing, you ain't, you ain't got it, you're, you're, you're lacking. No, it's part of growth. You don't look at teenagers and put them down for the things they don't know. No. Do you know that they're kind of loony in teenage years? <laughs> you know they got a ways to go. But you don't look at them thinking you're incomplete. <laughs> Parents, don't make your kids think that. Don't let them think that. Amen. No, it's just a growth process. God knows that we're growing. But he doesn't look at us thinking, oh, you old thing, you know, you're so far behind. You're complete in him who's the head of all principality and power. In him you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh of the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Do we need to say something by verse 11? You understand what that is? Rather than have to get circumcised in the flesh, don't have to do that anymore. Now Americans still do it, but you don't have to do it to be right with God. Does everybody know that already? You don't have to be circumcised to be right with God in the flesh. You know that, right? Everybody okay with that? But in the spirit, you must be circumcised. When you get born, when you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit circumcises your heart. Cuts off the stony deadness. So you can have a fleshy heart, clean spirit, alive unto God. Then he says, buried with him. You'll, you bury the old dead stuff. Buried with him in baptism in which you were raised, also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So your old deadness should be buried. If you, if you see your old dead self creeping up, if you see old, your old dead sinner ways creeping up, your old attitude, how many of you had an attitude in the world? Go ahead and raise your hand. I, just, I want everybody to admit your attitude. We all needed an attitude adjustment. Okay, we had a worldly attitude, a godless attitude, ornery attitude, selfish, greedy attitude. Isn't that right? Stupid attitude, mean attitude. We needed an attitude adjustment. You're supposed to bury the old attitude guy under the water. Everybody, every Christian needs to get baptized in water. When you do something in your soul recognizes, I'm laying this old man to rest, and also I'm professing it before people, and it solidifies it in your own mind. I'm going to serve God. Okay? You, spiritually, you're already taken care of when you confess Christ. But in your soul, something very powerful happens at baptism in water. The symbol is you bury the old man and come up raised with Christ. Then you're entrusted with the responsibility to live that way the rest of your life. If you find the old man creeping up with its depression, how many of you were, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you uh, ha ha dealt with depression as a sinner? Okay, depression is of the devil and it's not for saved people. So if you feel depression creeping up on you, it's the old man who's motivated by the devil and moved by Satan and demons and wrong thinking and wrong thoughts. When you feel depression creeping up, no, 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 you stay, you stay under that water. Amen. I mean, who, what fallen man wouldn't be depressed? It's the nature of fallen man to be depressed, to be oppressed, to be suppressed. To not have God would be terrible. Amen. Verse 13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together. Everybody say, I'm alive now. I'm, alive. I'm, not, dead. I'm not dead. I'm not dead in sin. Not dead. Come on, pause for a second. Let me explain. We do this out loud on purpose, not to just fill time. It's to help us express truth. When you express out of your mouth the truth of the Bible, miracles start taking place. Okay, you have to believe it and say it and all of a sudden it kind of lifts you into a spiritual uh, awareness or application 
Rather than just an acknowledgement of a truth that's out there, it comes in. So let's say it. I'm alive, I'm alive. together with him. I'm forgiven of all trespasses. I'm forgiven of all trespasses. I'm alive together with him. I'm alive in spirit. Amen. Verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Everybody, all of your shortcomings, all those years, and all those years to come. Oh, it wasn't. Yours isn't blank. Yours has stuff on it. Okay? Yours had stuff on it. All those years and all those years to come. Stuff on it. Requirements against you. Ordinances against you. Judgments against you. Lawsuits against you. Penalty for sin. You've been rude. There's penalty for being rude. Did you know that? There's penalty for your flesh sins. There's penalty for your heart sins. There's penalty for not walking in love with your Christian people. There's penalty. He took all of that and he nailed it to the cross. And so now when God looks at you, he does see blank. All of your ordinances, judgments were nailed to the cross. So we're free. That's kind of exciting. Verse 15, now here's where he talks about what happened in hell. God talks about what happened in hell when Jesus went down into the depths of the earth for three days. Remember that? Yep. That the Son of Man, just like Jonah was three days in the belly of the well, the Son of Man would be in the center of the earth or the depths of the earth. He would be buried for three days, but he, he, he wasn't just physically in the tomb. He went down into the lower parts of the earth. He that ascended also first descended. He descended it down there, and this is one thing that happened down there. Verse 15, he, he you know, he, the devil thought he had him. Jesus rose up alive, and it says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah. This refers to uh, back in the old colonial, uh, not colonial, uh, back in the old Roman days, when uh, one nation would conquer another nation, they would take the, the conquered king, tie him to the, the trailer, tie him to the, the, the buggy, tie him to the horse or the cart, and parade him around the city, making fun of him, making a spectacle of the defeated king. Well, that's what Jesus did to the devil for us. The devil made a show, made a public spectacle of the devil, stripped him of his armor, took the keys of this earth, took the authority back from the devil, made fun of him in public, in the spirit realm. The angels saw it, the demons saw it. It's better to be on the winning team if you're getting made fun of, right? And so it's over. It's over, saints. The, Jesus has won. Yeah. It's over. The war's over. Yeah. He won it for you. Your battle against sin is over. He won it for you. Stay in him, you've won. Do it in your own self, you haven't won. Hallelujah. Then he goes on and talks about trying to do it in your own strength. And we'll, we'll, we'll read a little bit and see how far we go. We'll end on time. Verse 16, so let, so let, because everything's been conquered already, for you already have won. Don't go back into a carnal place in your own self-worth. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or in regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. This was how the Old Testament was built, on outward things. Food and drink, that was important to, the, to those under the law. And regarding festival, feast days, uh, seasons, new moons, and Sabbaths. That was the Jewish law. He says, now that we're saved and set free, don't let anybody judge you with that. 
No, don't let anybody put that on you. That it's great to be a Christian, but you'd be better if you'd, if you'd really uh, obey the new moons and the feasts, feasts and the Sabbath days. And if you'd quit eating all that stuff that Gentiles eat, you'd be holier. Which are a shadow of things to come. All that stuff in the Old Testament was a shadow of what was to come. But the substance is of Christ. Now let me explain this. Look up here. This is pretty interesting. I've always seen this, not, noticed this, and thought it was just, just a crazy plan that God had. Okay? You know, a shadow of a thing requires a thing. The thing comes first before the shadow. Shadows never appear unless there's a thing. So the shadow is really not first. It's just the after effect of a thing and a light. Does that make sense? So how can the Old Testament, which, which came first, be the shadow of something in the future? Because the something in the future already existed. His name is Christ. Jesus has existed from the foundation of the world. He already existed before the Old Testament ever showed up. It wasn't that Christ came out of the Old Testament, out of the nation. He existed before the nation. Yes, he did. Jesus has always been. He is the Lord. He's the creator. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with, was with God. The Word was God. Jesus, the Christ, he is the substance. He's the real deal. Hallelujah. The only reason the Old Testament had to come was because the earth wasn't ready for the real deal. The earth wasn't ready to walk with God. They proved it in the garden. But Christ already existed. All the shadow. Who wants to be with a shadow? Hey, Mark, you want to come over? I want to hang out with your shadow. That's, that's boring if you got the real guy. Even if he makes little funny things on the wall. You know, that's, that's no fun. The shadow was nothing. It was nothing. It was just the only thing man could handle at the time. The substance is of Christ. Hallelujah. You never look at somebody in the room and say, where's your shadow? I want to see your shadow. Where's your shadow? I want to see your shadow. Where's your shadow? I want to see your shadow. See your shadow. I'm happy with having you, buddy. You with me? When you really get saved and turned on to the Lord, Jesus takes root, takes form inside you. The shadow means very little. I like some of the stuff in the Old Testament. I'm not throwing the Old Testament out. But the person of Christ within is everything. The experience of the relationship of Christ within is everything. Hallelujah. So don't come trying to make me eat differently. I mean, you know, there's denominations of churches that come to the Christian and say, you guys think that the Sabbath is Sunday, but it's not, it's Saturday. And you should be keeping the Sabbath holy like us. You'd be better. And they kind of put up with, you know, they, they really, they kind of put up with the Christian who thinks it's Sunday. But like, we're the smart ones. We, we know it's Saturday. That's how, that's how religious people stuck in the shadow, think. The vanity of their mind. We'll read verse 18, we'll end, because it, it explains it. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. See, if you start putting emphasis on outward things you can do to be better, you start puffing yourself up. Well, I, you, guys, you guys are good, but I'm better. You guys probably don't know how much I fast and pray. Take, take Lent season has begun. Some of you know some Catholics, and I'm not putting down Catholics, but you know, that's the discussion of the month. What have you given up for Lent? I gave up. I gave up. I gave up. And I know you just got mad at me when I acted all sarcastic. That's because that's what the flesh looks like. That's what, we're, that's what we don't need to do. That's what Christians don't need to go into. Vainly puffed up by our fleshly mind. 
Real quick, let me mention, no one cheat, let no one cheat you of your reward taking delight in false humility. That refers to uh, humbling yourself on the outside. Not eating. I mean, fasting is good for a purpose, but it's not, it's not the thing. It's not the badge that you wear. Make sense? False humility were people who had strict self-denial rules. They basically denied themselves of anything pleasurable. Would only eat a one fig a day. Uh, some, some, some would sleep on pillars. They were called pillar Christians. And they would sleep on, on pillars. Some would deny themselves sleep. Others would sleep on pillars to prove that they were suffering in some manner. Putting their pleasure away to prove that they were more spiritual. You follow me? That's false humility. Falsely humbling yourself as if that means something. And we do that today. We esteem people that have some strict code of self-discipline. Don't we? The world esteems this thing. Somebody's denied themselves pleasure or has a certain strict code of living. And we think, ooh, well, that's the world's esteem. Spiritual side means nothing. Now, we do like disciplined lives, but don't add it to the esteem side. Amen? Gotcha. All right, we'll talk about the rest, worship of angels and stuff next time. We'll end, we'll end there for tonight. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. If you're in Houston and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we are certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, salvation through Jesus Christ, or this ministry, please visit us on the web or download our Houston Faith phone app.